But you all thought we were going to do the collection again, eh? Well, surely, if you do something twice, then it'll happen. Surely, it'll happen again. We'll get double the money. Well, there's a bit of formal logic for you. Or maybe we could all collectively think the money into existence. You know, the idea creates the world outside, so why can't we just create the money we need? But unfortunately, we are materialists. And we know that that just doesn't work. Now, we have a serious discussion in front of us. Um, and in 35 minutes, obviously, I cannot go into every detail. But I'd invite the comrades to use the material which is available on our website. We have some excellent lead-offs. We have Alan talking on Marxist philosophy. Dan talking on postmodernism. Hamid talking on um, uh, Hegel to Marx and under the talks. We have the new magazine with, with the, the relaunch of In Defense of Marxism magazine. With an excellent article on postmodernism. So we're providing comrades with the, with the ammunition, basically. The, the, the weapons with which to carry out our battle. I want to start by quoting something from Marx. You probably heard this before, you've seen it before. This is the quote. <clears throat> the, the weapon of criticism cannot, of course, replace criticism of the weapon. Material force must be overthrown by material force. So up to here, one, might think that Marx is saying what is important is action. Which of course it is. But immediately afterwards in the same sentence, he says this. But theory also becomes a material force. As soon as it has gripped the masses, he wrote this in 1843, in the, the contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, the introduction. Now, that's a profound statement. And it highlights the importance of theory for Marx.
and it continues to be just as important today for us. Marx's philosophy is really the culmination of centuries, if not millennia, of human thought. It wasn't invented from scratch. But it built on the, uh, the great thinkers of the past. But with Marx, philosophy finally reaches where it should be. I.e., it gives us an understanding of how the material world moves and changes and evolves. But it's not just that. It's also an instrument for changing the material world consciously. It does not limit itself to analyzing things as they are. But it also fights to change the reality around us. Back in 1995, we published a book called Reason in Revolt. by Alan Woods and Ted Grant. Now, you could, you could ask yourselves why, when we had smaller forces than we have today, why publish a book on Marxism and modern science? Well, the answer to that, as Marx pointed out, is to understand the power of ideas. A theory that, that explains scientifically and rationally why things happen, why they have happened, why we are where we are, is a powerful force. It gives those who adhere to this idea an inner strength. It gives a conviction that we are on the right path. You know, Galileo, he knew that he was right. Although he was attacked for saying what he, what, he, what he said. He simply stated the, the earth goes around the sun. And we comrades, we know that we are right too. but we're working against the stream. Under attack from the bourgeois class. That's because our ideas are a threat to their system and with that to their privileges. This system is in decay. Just look around you, just look around, just look at the news every day. Remember what we just discussed in World Perspectives. 
10 minutes, Fred. The world is pregnant with revolution. But it requires a midwife. And that is the, the Marxist, the mass revolutionary party of Marxism. But before we can become a mass force, we have to win the battle of ideas. Starting with ourselves first. with our cadres, without steeled Marxist cadres, there will be no Marxist party. The strength of the organization is in the strength of its cadres. And in building a solid foundation in Marxist theory, and educating all the comrades in a thorough understanding of dialectical materialism. And this is not a detail of our work. It, it's, it's, it's a central aspect of our work. The intelligent bourgeois understand the power of ideas. That's why they are constantly uh, churning out ideas that deny the essence of Marxism. They are constantly announcing the death of Marxism. And if Marxism died a long time ago, you don't need to keep announcing the death. What they're actually saying is they wish it were dead. The reason why Marxism does not die is because it is true. Now, as an international, we are launch, we've launched our campaign for the, the defense of Marxist philosophy. Now, why are we doing this? Why do we need to defend Marxism? Because capitalism in, in its senile decay promotes old ideas. We also promote old ideas. The ideas of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. But they promote idealism as a philosophical outlook. Which is a negation of scientific rational thinking. And the most consistent rational thinking is Marxism. So our battle is to uh, combat these bourgeois ideas. We have a philosophical approach. Without that, we would be lost as Marxists. We would lose the ability to understand 
would lose the ability to understand society, to understand history, science, economics. If we lose sight of the movement of history, then everything is atomized. And the class struggle itself loses meaning. And as the bourgeois and their reformist reflections in the labor movement love to say, the, the class struggle ceases to exist. Now, what we have to do here is establish what Marxism is. It's a world historical view and it's not just attacking other ideas. I often see comrades who love to do a bit of identity politics bashing. Which is obviously part of what we do. But it's not the, 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 the main emphasis that we should give to our work. We should explain what we stand for. Now, I've, I've looked at the, um, the, the, uh, the draft, the final draft of Alan's new book, which is about to come out, I think, in September. The History of Philosophy. And in the introduction, Alan explains that we, you know, we don't reject the great ideas. We don't forget the big ideological battles of the past. But we recover them. And in that book, Alan gives an excellent account into the historical development of philosophical thinking. from the ancient Greeks right up to Marxism. Now, first and foremost, Marxism is materialist. The world, the universe, the objects around us, they exist independent of whether we think about them or not. We ourselves are a product of that. We're part of that. Idealism, on the other hand, turns everything on its head. For them, it's not matter that becomes organized in a certain way and produces the human brain which can think. But it's the idea that creates the reality. That kind of thinking can only function at the end of the day if you actually have a God, the supreme idea, the supreme thinker that gives everything else existence. I was brought up a good Catholic boy. And I can remember thinking, seriously thinking, what, you, what, what if he forgets? 
That's 20 minutes, Brad. If he forgets about us, we, we cease to exist. Uh, that is the way a lot of people actually think. They're educated to think like that. The idea is that the, 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 the thinking is not done by the human body, but it's done by something external, a soul that lives temporarily in this material body. And you can see how primitive people in particular can, can think like that because they have little knowledge, actually scientific knowledge of actually how things really work. Hello? Sorry, I'm quiet. Um, okay, okay, okay. My, it was my computer maybe. Um, now, philosophy has um, attempted to explain things, society, etc. Now, as I said at the beginning, um, centuries of different forms of philosophical thinking eventually led to the development of Marxism. Now, what the idealist can't cope with is the idea that matter itself can actually think. The human brain is, material, is matter organized in a certain way. Part of the whole body, the nervous system, etc. And we think by seeing, by hearing, by speaking, by feeling, by exchanging with other people. And it's billions of years of evolution which has finally produced this form. And what has allowed human beings to rise to a higher level of, level of thinking is an accumulation of knowledge over centuries, over millennia. Which is connected to the development of the productive forces, to technique, to science, etc. which has allowed us to see beyond our immediate experience i mean if you base yourself only on your immediate experience you'd have to say the world is flat or that the the sun does go around the earth Now we understand that's not, that's not the case. Um, where did that understanding come from? Did it come just from pure thinking, i.e. Um, speculating in conversations between human beings? No, it didn't. It came from a development of technique which gives humans the ability to see far beyond their own limited physical uh, ability. Now, materialism 
is one aspect of Marxism. Um, but it's not the only one. There's the other side of it, which is the dialectic. Because the problem with materialism and dialectics separated from each other was that both of them were limited in giving us uh, a greater understanding. Materialism tended to look at things in a static uh, manner. And dialectics looked at things in an idealist manner. Um, it, was, it was Marx and Engels who brought the two together. showing that the dialectic is not simply the way thought evolves, but the, the thinking was simply a reflection of the real dialectic in the real material world. And therefore, by bringing the two together, materialism and dialectics, you actually finally see how things really are. Not static matter, not motionless materialism. but matter in motion and constant change and transformation. And that, that, that it can be understood and that laws can be developed about how it moves and changes. Now, this is clearly a much higher form of thinking than what had existed before. Now, you see, a higher form of thinking um, involves dealing with concepts that the everyday life of human beings doesn't equip us with, doesn't equip us with the, the tools to deal with these higher forms of thinking. Because you see, in everyday life, things have a beginning and an end. You plant a seed, it grows into a plant, you, you, you cut it, you eat it, it began, it ended. You have a choice. You have a child, it's born. And one day it dies. That makes it difficult for humans to grasp, for example, for example the concept of infinity. In time and space. The idea that matter has no beginning and no end. It's not easy for people to grasp that. And yet, 
once you rise above everyday life and everyday experience and you have a long historical view and a higher level of thinking and gr greater scientific knowledge and greater discoveries, human beings begin to move in the direction of understanding things that previously they could not understand. And that brings us to the question of what, it, what is knowable? Is there, is there a limit to it? Even the question is posed, can we know? Can we actually really know the material world? The idealists start from, from the fact that if we, if we see, if we acknowledge what's around us through our senses, how can I know that I'm not creating what I'm feeling and seeing? That's 30 minutes, Fred. And could your sentences be slightly shorter? Okay. Um, questions such as, are sensations a material thing? What are they? We now know, thanks to science, how the eye works. how light, which is a material thing, enters the eye through the lens and hits the retina. And through the nervous system reaches the brain. And we see. And, it, and it's a material thing. Same with sound. How do we perceive sound through the ear? Science has actually answered all the questions on that. And yet you still have these idealist uh, uh, ideas. <laughs> If you take idealism to its extreme, it means that I don't even know if you guys actually exist. I ask myself, do I exist? Am I a figment of my own imagination? Now, one can say, what, what, that's ridiculous. And yet, that school of thought is still there. It's present, for instance, in, 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 in the so-called postmodernist uh, so-called philosophy. Now, there's been, there's been this division fundamentally between, fundamentally on the one side, the materialist approach, and on the other, the idealist, since the times of the ancient Greeks. Idealism reduces knowledge to a subjective process. and basically declares that there is no such thing as objective truth. So everybody has their own 
um, individual reality. And it denies there's such a thing as a generalized objective truth as valid for all. You have university students who think they are really clever when they say something like, yes, but how do you know that the red that you see is the red that I see? Basically, everybody can see things in their own individual way. What it means is basically elevating the individual above society. It's the atomization of society. And most importantly for us, it means the atomization of the working class. What it means is there's a denial that there's such a thing as a common interest um, of a whole class. But we only have individual interests. And this is a philosophical outlook. And think about it, it justifies the individualism of the capitalist system. And ultimately the profit of the individual. And therein lies the usefulness of idealism for the ruling class. We, on the other hand, understand that there is a collective interest. There's a common interest that unites millions of human beings. The class struggle is an expression of that. And one of the most profound uh, ideas of Marx was when he explained that the his history is actually the history of class struggle. And if you, if you grasp that idea, you start to see history in a completely different way from the way they teach it at school. As I said, there's the materialism, but there's also the dialectic. The early Greek philosophers attempted to, to, to tackle the question of, you know, what is, how do things work? What is the world like, really? It represented a move away from religious explanation of phenomena. I, an understanding of objective processes without the need for an external God or a spirit that uh, gives it uh, the, 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 the motion. Heraclitus famously said that 
everything is and is not. And that's because everything is in flux. There's a constant process of change and movement. It's 40 minutes, Fred. But the question is not enough to say that things are constantly in motion and change. People can grasp the idea that all of us are slowly getting older. That we no longer live in caves. But the question is, how does the change take place? Is it just a mere slow accumulation, gradual change, bit by bit, constantly throughout history? Or are there moments of sudden change, of leaps? Any study of history will show you that history is made of many such leaps and sudden changes. Yes, there are small gradual changes and an accumulation of change. And the reformists love that idea. They think that's, that's the way things change, slowly, slowly, bit by bit. But we understand that there's a dialectical relationship between the accumulation of small changes, which eventually produces such a quantity of change that it produces a qualitative change, which then suddenly appears as a, as a shock, a surprise, something unexpected that suddenly happens. Now, if you look at history, you can see that. But science has now also provided uh, a lot of evidence. Reason and revolt goes through all of that, um, explaining how these sudden leaps, sudden qualitative changes take place at all levels. Now, this is how we Marxists understand history. Engels referring to dialectics referred to the general laws of nature, human society and human thought. He said, um, in the dialectics of nature, it is therefore from the history of nature and human society that the laws of dialectics are abstracted.
dialectics are not something that Marxists impose on reality. It's not because we want it to be like that. It is because that is the way matter behaves. And it's basically a conscious realization that the, there are laws that can be understood, can be developed and in turn, then applied to understand society. Such as the law of the transformation of quantity into quality and vice versa. the interpenetration of opposites and the negation of the negation. And, and, and Engels explains that Hegel had developed the, 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 these laws. Of course, he developed them in an idealist fashion. He says, the mistake, referring to Hegel, lies in the fact that these laws are foisted on nature and history as laws of thought and not deducted from them. And he says, if we turn the thing round, then everything becomes simple. And the dialectical laws that look so extremely mysterious in idealist philosophy at once become simple and clear as noonday. He then goes on to use that method and he takes many, many examples from science and nature uh, as humans had accumulated their knowledge so up till then and shows by example after example how the dialectic actually works. Now, Alan has just finished working on his new book, The History of Philosophy. And if you read it, it gives you a sense, a sense of purpose actually to history itself. There is a, there is a sense to history. There is a direction to history. We find this already expressed in Hegel. an upward movement. We could call it, and if there's any postmodernists who happen to come here by mistake, we could refer to it as, God forbid, progress. A long historical process from the first microbial forms of life about 3.7 billion years ago, up to the human brain.
and human society. But we are not at the end of that process. We are merely in one, albeit crucial phase of that process. And we understand the progress has not stopped. In a certain sense, you could say, for the, for the bourgeois philosophies, progress has stopped. Why? Because their system has ceased to provide progress. It's 50 minutes, Fred. But that doesn't mean that human society can no longer progress. That is the struggle that we are involved in, of course. We're part of that struggle, the struggle to move on to the next phase of human development. And the point about bourgeois philosophy, and Alan makes that brilliantly in the book, he gives examples, outlines it. You see, up until Marx and Engels, the best, the most brilliant of the bourgeois philosophers were genuinely trying to move human thinking forward. They contributed actually to the formation of Marxism. Not consciously, obviously. But the great insights that each one of them gave brought us a step closer to the final conclusion. But that means that once Marx and Engels had raised philosophy to the level of dialectical materialism, bourgeois philosophy could no longer progress. It would have to accept the conclusions of Marxism. And that, of course, the bourgeois class cannot do as a class. Because they have a material interest in negating Marxism and scientific thinking. That in turn explains the emergence of this so-called philosophy postmodernism. It, re it rejects rationality. It rejects what they refer to as modernism. They reject objectivity. And especially since the Second World War, and especially since the, the 70s, this idea has gained greater and greater popularity amongst bourgeois academics, the academic world, and with the bourgeois class itself. I don't have time to go into it, but it's not by chance that 
some of the important contributors to postmodernism actually originated in the Stalinist milieu. They thought they understood Marxism, which in act, but in actual fact, it was Stalinism. In rejecting the Stalinist caricature, they ended up rejecting everything that Marxism had to offer. They failed to understand what happened in the post-war period. And they drew the conclusions that the class struggle was not the way to change society. And there was a regression, even philosophically speaking, back towards idealism, back towards a rejection of objective thinking. A rejection of the idea that you can have a world view, a world historical view. That there are no objective processes, that there are no laws that which we can discern in the, in the processes. And everything is back to the individual. As I said, a very useful idea for the ruling class. which denies the class struggle. Um, there are many postmodernists, I can't go into all of them, and it's not even necessary to do so. Uh, that, Daniel did it much more in detail in one of his lead offs. But these people try to present themselves as more advanced, more nuanced. They look at things in, 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 a, in, a, in a new way, as opposed to the old objective materialist ways. But in reality, there's nothing new in what they say. Because everything that bourgeois philosophy could say was said long ago. Now, the purpose of these so-called philosophers is essentially to deny Marxism. And it's not by chance the commies have seen this, the, the documents, the CIA discovered the usefulness of these uh, so-called radical thinkers. Because it presented itself as radical, as modern, as new. And it could be used as an instrument for pulling particularly young people away from the genuine ideas of revolutionary Marxism and confuse them with all these ideas of the postmodernists. I found an interesting article that refers to Foucault, for example. Uh, 
it's, it's a critique of Foucault. And he says this, rather than drawing on and contributing to the further development of collective traditions of knowledge production, Uh, Foucault puts forth novel histories that are unique to his individual vision. That's 60 minutes, Fred. Basically, rejecting, instead of doing what Marx and Engels did, which was to take the best of all the thinkers of the past, these guys think that they're they're, they're, they're so brilliant, they don't need that. They can just sweep away thousands of years, actually, of human thinking and develop their, their, their novel ideas. His aim was to, to reject Marxism. But the point is this, once you reject the basic tenets of Marxism, the only direction you can go in thinking is backwards. And that is what postmodernism is. To bring to a conclusion, if we, if we return to the emergence of Marxist philosophy, it owes much to Hegel, in particular the, the dialectics. But as I said, the limits of Hegel were, were the, the, the idealist way he used the dialectic. At a certain point, it reached the limits of what it could achieve. And it had to be negated, to use a Marxist or a dialectical term. And you see figures like Feuerbach that play a role in that. But in rejecting the idealism um, and uh, adopting a materialist approach, he also threw out what was useful in, in the Hegelian thought. So he played a useful role, but he didn't achieve the final result, which was necessary. Marx and Engels, taking the materialism that Feuerbach had, pro had promoted in his writings, did not throw out the dialectic, they saved it. They combined it with materialism. And I basically, the dialectical laws are an expression of how the material world, the real objective world, moves, develops, and is transformed. Yeah. 
Alan has added the last chapter to his book, which is a new chapter from the text we had previously. And it's the passage from Hegel to Marx, the different passages and how that took place, the, the development of the ideas from Hegel for, through to Fuhr back to Marx, Engels. It's, uh, it's, it, you'll find it very, very interesting reading, comrades. It shows you how we got to the final product, which is what we use today. With this new philosophical outlook, Marx and Engels were, were able to explain how capitalism works. Marx's greatest contribution, um, one of his greatest contributions, Das Kapital, would not have been possible without Marx and Engels' dialectical materialist understanding. They looked for the contradictions, they looked for the mechanisms, they looked for what pushes the system forward and also how it would develop and where it would lead. They also use it to analyze how the class struggle develops. And it is comrades, our most powerful weapon. The weapon of, of the ideas. The comrades of, must dedicate the necessary time to studying Marxism. Read each of the classical texts thoroughly, discuss it in reading groups, um, absorb the ideas and the methods. But there, there is also a lot of counterfeit Marxism out there. We, we have to establish what Marxism is, but also what it is not. In September, the plan is to publish the history of philosophy. I think it will serve to raise the level of the whole organization. It will serve to strengthen the whole organization. Alan is also working on another book. Which is on actual Marxist philosophy itself. And I've been, every time I have a chance, I push him, get on with it. We need that book. It will take some time, but I think it will be um, a, a major addition to our understanding of Marxism. And just to, to finish, our task is not our task is not to innovate. It's not to find novel ideas. But it's to defend the basic ideas of Marxism.
more than anything else, to defend the method of Marxism. And make sure our comrades study and grasp the method. Then they will be able to use it. The task is to steal our cadres build a solid cadre organization based on these ideas which will be the foundations for the building of powerful parties in the future which will finally put an end to the nightmare of this society And we will, we will show them that there is such a thing as progress. And that is a future communist society, comrades. <laughs>